Dracula's afterlife in the cinema is a well-known part of his story, the story of Gothic. But the Gothic has many tributaries, irrigating the hinterlands of the British imagination. And never more so than with Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, published in 1899, just two years after Dracula. It tells the tale of the evil Kurtz, a trader in African ivory, with his foreign sounding name, his ability to stay one step ahead, and his bloodthirsty nature, well, does he remind you of anyone? In chasing Kurtz's Dracula-like shadow, the novel builds up a picture of the horrors wrought upon Africa by Europeans along the banks of the Congo. It might be a deeper, darker river than the Thames, and one capable of swallowing it whole, but it's the British River as gateway to empire and the carve-up of Africa which is the real villain of the piece. In Heart of Darkness, the Empire comes home to roost, to London and the Thames estuary. On the first page of the novel, Conrad describes the sky above this reach as dark, condensed to a mournful gloom, brooding motionless over the greatest town on earth. And then Charles Marlowe begins his story about the plunder of African ivory, telling it to the assembled company of a boat called the Nelly, moored right here, just where Conrad himself, in real life, moored his own boat, also named the Nelly. There's a strong sense in Heart of Darkness that although it was the Belgians who first exploited and colonized the Congo, we Europeans are all in it together. We're all responsible for the atrocities of empire. The enslavement of millions of Africans was one of the great historic crimes against humanity. The points brought home by Conrad's narrator, Marlowe, with a dark little fantasy. Having described the actual abandoned dwellings of Africans fleeing slavery, he then imagines the reverse. Black slavers coming here and rounding up the English. A solitude, a solitude, nobody, not a hut. The population had cleared out a long time ago. Well, if a lot of mysterious niggers armed with all kinds of fearful weapons suddenly took to traveling on the road between Deal and Gravesend, catching the yokels right and left to carry heavy loads for them, I fancy every farm and cottage thereabouts would get empty very soon. Conrad is widely seen as part of the canon in the great tradition of the English novel. But like Dickens, he was a writer who drew deeply on the Gothic. He understood that it wasn't merely a genre. It could be a way of seeing, a way of thinking. And in Heart of Darkness, he plunges the reader into a labyrinth, at the centre of which lies a terrible secret. What could be more Gothic than that? And the whole tale is spoken. It comes out of the mouth of a haunted man, like a spell or an incantation. Marlowe is a mesmerizing, magical narrator, though he conjures with hideous images. On the riverbank settlement that is his ultimate destination, he encounters the handiwork of Kurtz, the enigmatic European trader who's been applying his philosophy of exterminate all the brutes. There was no enclosure or fence of any kind, but there had been one apparently, for near the house half a dozen slim posts remained in a row, roughly trimmed, and with their upper ends ornamented with round carved balls. Now I had suddenly a nearer view and its first result was to make me throw my head back, as if before a blow. These round knobs were not ornamental. Only one, the first I had made out, was facing my way. Black, dried, sunken, with closed eyelids. A head that seemed to sleep at the top of that pole, and with the sunken, dry lips showing a narrow white line of the teeth, smiling continuously at some endless and jocose dream of that eternal slumber. Marlowe first sees the heads, 
Kurtz the vampire's human prey through his binoculars, glasses in the story. He might almost have been filming or using a viewfinder. No wonder that soon after publication and in the wake of photos of mutilated African workers, the novel was seen as a form of documentary, a Kodak on the Congo. From the wizardry of Conrad's words comes a clear image, the sort of reflection you'd expect from a writer who called another book the Mirror of the Sea. In Heart of Darkness, the Congo, for all its murky depths, is the river as mirror. Telling the truth through a distortion. It's one of the oldest tropes of Gothic fiction. The idea of the wonky mirror, which yet reveals, is at the heart of a much neglected section of Ruskin's essay on the Gothic, which deals with the fearful and dark side, the grotesque, and might almost be a description of Conrad's method in Heart of Darkness. In Ruskin's definition of the Gothic, he places great weight on its more horrifying, distorted imagery, the fearful grotesque, he calls it. And yet he argues that it shows us a kind of truth. Paraphrasing St. Paul, he says, the minds of men are dim. We see the world as if through a glass darkly. And for Ruskin, it's worse than that, because for him, the mirror of our perception is misted by the breath of Satan. And that's where the Gothic, with its grotesquerie, comes in. It cleans that mirror. What it shows us might be distorted, might be terrifying, but we see it, we know it's the truth, and we see it clearly. Ruskin understood the dark side of the Gothic, its potential to tell us truths we don't want to hear. Kurtz's heads on sticks are pure Gothic grotesque. They hark back to the bloodlust of Vlad Dracula, also known as the Impaler, the real-life 15th-century Romanian prince who inspired Bram Stoker. Another reason to think of Kurtz as a kind of imperial vampire. But those same heads staring sightlessly into the Congo also indicate that there are even bigger fish in Conrad's river. Heart of Darkness has been described as imperial gothic, but it's a novel of ideas which goes far beyond anxieties about empire alone. Like H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, published in 1895, just four years before, Heart of Darkness has the ambition to contemplate us as a species. As the 20th century loomed, some writers looked forward with dread, revising Darwin's theory of evolution. Were we not, in fact, de-evolving rather than evolving, regressing rather than progressing, our civilization merely a veneer beneath which we were no more advanced than so-called primitive peoples. Africa in Conrad is the site of utter human degeneracy. But it is a European and a highly sophisticated one, Kurtz, who goes beyond all moral limits to the horror, the horror, as it is put at the end of the novel. This is what Conrad brings back home to that stretch of the Thames. His Kodak on the Congo is also a portrait of his own doorstep. Great Britain and Europe. Whether they were confronting the monsters of modern market forces or the horrors of global colonialism, the writers of the fin de siècle and the early 20th century found themselves increasingly drawn to the terror and cruelty of the Gothic tradition. And as the world itself seemed to descend into nightmare with the outbreak of the First World War, so too did literature descend ever deeper into the realm of the Gothic. <laughs> 